Hello, I'm Dr. Gareth Clear Evans. Uh, welcome to this short lecture where we will be looking at Henry Gibson's play Heather Gabler. Um, if you're watching this video, if you're planning to attend the live online seminar, I'm going to assume that you are already quite familiar with the text, that you've, that you've read the play or have seen the production. Um, I'm not going to spend almost any time at all uh, looking at sort of the characters or the themes or the, the narrative uh, of the play. But rather what I'd like to do in the time that we have available is to begin by sort of asking broader questions about what we do when we encounter texts um, such as this one. Uh, what do we do with plays that are from the dramatic modern canon? Because since it was first staged um, in 1891 in Munich, I think Hedda Gabler has become um, the, the play of the modern European dramatic canon. Um, it's been continuously performed throughout the 20th century and in the 21st. Um, it's, uh, I think to perform as Hedda is considered to be the to be the high point of many an actress's career. And so it's clearly a play that has continually and continues to resonate um, with audiences, despite the fact that it's set in a very particular time and a very particular place, uh, reflecting the concerns of a very particular social economic um, uh, milieu. So one of the things that I would like to, to think about today and to um, invite you to think about in preparation uh, for the live sessions, to think about what are the contemporary resonances that we might find that we might find in the play and how those might be uh, made clear through through a production or through through a staging of Ibsen's texts. Because I think this, these are the type of questions that we should be continuously asking of these uh, of such kind of plays that we consider to be sort of classics or that have some kind of, sort of unquestioned status within within our culture. Um, and we should always ask uh, anew every time, how does this text sort of generate its meaning? How does it function? How does it signal to its audience um, what it is about? Um, and where does that happen in the moment where the text uh, meets the audience in the theatrical um, encounter? So this uh, short lecture will be divided into, into three short sections. Uh, in the first one, we'll think about uh, sort of approaching Hedda Gabler. What are the what are the assumptions or the presuppositions that we have in relation uh, to the text? Uh, in the second one, I'll think about how theatre studies might help us address some of the assumptions that uh, that arise when we analyse uh, the text. And then in the third and final section, I will look at one uh, specific case study uh, from a staging um, at the Sherman Theatre in 2019, um, directed by Chelsea Walker, which I think did really sort of interesting and uh, provocative things um, in the stagings that made it feel incredibly um, and resonant and, and contemporary. Um, so I'll begin by sort of thinking about what are the challenges that we face when analysing a play um, such as this one. Um, I think the first assumption that we that we make when we read a play like this is that we know that it's a naturalistic play, that we recognise it as being um, similar to our own experience of being in the world. Um, and so in naturalism people move, talk and they interact with each other as if they were real people. Um, they are presented to us as if this is real life. Um, and of course, it's not real life. These are not real people. And this is partly to do with, with, with aesthetics, with the question of style, because you know, people don't, people rarely talk in full, complete sentences like they do in the play. People always, you know, they talk across each other. People stand in proximity to, to each other differently in real life. So we approach this play thinking that it is a play that looks and feels like real life, but actually when we experience it, it's, it's, uh, it looks like real life and feels like it. It has the density of how we experience the world, um, but doesn't quite um, align with it. There is something uncanny, something slightly uncomfortable about the fact that we think it's real, but um, it obviously isn't. And tied to that is, is the play's particular setting um, and its particular narrative. So it's set in a place at a time and the dramatic structure, the narrative, is built around a particular set of social economic concerns. Um, you know, it's a play very much about the, the career ambitions of academic men and the way that the women in their lives are sort of dragged into that rivalry um, as a result. Um, it doesn't particularly feel uh, universal. 
Um, and I, it's one of the one of my experiences of the play whenever I read it or whenever I see it is that it feels it feels really strange. It's really weird what happens in the play. Um, and I think this was one of the reasons because it's uh, because it's naturalistic because it's supposed to be real. There's also an expectation that the uh, that the narrative is also somehow universal or somehow applicable to our own lives. And it is very very different. I think. Um, I don't think many of us um, live in very nice houses in Oslo suburbs um, with maids and go on six month holidays. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's in a world very much, I think, removed, certainly from my own and I imagine from many of you um, as well. Um, but stepping back from the sort of immediate concerns of what happens in the play itself, when we encounter a play such as Hedda Gabler, uh, we sort of come to it knowing that it is famous, knowing that it is important, um, perhaps that it contains an important message. Um, and so we sort of regard it as something that carries its meaning with it. And it's our job as an audience or as a reader to sort of discover it, to unpick it, that it contains something that is worth discovering. And I think what often happens uh, with these kind of canonical texts as well is that we consider them really uh, closely intertwined with the voice of the author. So if there is universal meaning to be found in Hedda Gabler, then that, um, that has arisen from the text that is written by Henrik Ibsen. Um, and so he is the voice of authority and he is the creator of meaning. And if there is a text like this that continues to be performed, that perhaps speaks to universal truths, then there is an assumption that those truths have been written uh, in the pen of of a man and a white man. So he is the one that tells us these universal truths. Um, also, it's it's a tragedy, and we know that it's a tragedy. So I think this is part of its sort of reputation. So if you've if you've never read it or never seen it, um, I'm not sure if the if the ending is is much of a surprise. You, we sort of know this is how how the play ends. Its, its reputation precedes it. Um, and I think one of the really interesting things about the play is that there is a, a tension, or I find at least, between what happens, particularly in the first and second act, and so the violence that happens at the end of the play. There's almost nothing really, um, the stakes are, are not high enough for you to justify the carnage that we experience um, at the end. It feels really shocking and incongruent with what has, what has come before. So what I've done there is list some of the things that always um, that always strikes me as a bit odd or a bit strange about the play whenever I read or see it. Um, but I don't want you to think that I'm sort of dismissing the play either. Um, this is not to think of it as irrelevant or old fashioned or that there are these strange irreconcilable contrasts um, within, within the text. Because I think these inherent contradictions are one of the reasons um, why it continues to be performed. Um, and of course, this is a very subjective opinion, but I think you know, it is a really good play. Um, it's a very rich dramatic text um, and it's with, it is within those contradictions and within its ambiguities um, that it allows for all kinds of possible uh, interpretations and permutations and, uh, and different threads to be explored and focused upon in any kind of staging. Um, and one of the central tensions and one of its central contradictions I think is is the fact that Hedda is very much a victim of her circumstances. Uh, she is um, she is a woman uh, who is who is trapped and suffocating uh, in the life that has been built for her. She lacks agency, and particularly in a relationship to the men around her, she she is denied the possibility of self determination. Um, and also, I think there's something in the play that. Um, it's about you know, neurotic male academics and these these women's lives are sort of dragged into into their neurosis, um, and so um, she is a victim of her circumstance. It is her tragedy, um, and yet often in the play she behaves in ways um, that are irresponsible um, and that make it really quite hard um, to feel sympathetic uh, towards her. I often find myself having to having to make quite an effort to feel to feel sorry for her. Um, she is also a woman of, of some significant privilege and, and that's something that I'll talk about um, in the final section. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about the play as well is the, is the sort of finality of, the, of Hedda's actions um, at its conclusion. 
Um, particularly if we compare it to perhaps the ending of um, Ibsen's other famous play, A Doll's House, in which uh, the wife and mother, Nora Helmer, decides to leave her husband and her children. And at the end of the play, she sort of famously and scandalously at the time um, uh, shuts the door behind her. Um, but when we encounter that play now, I think what happens in A Doll's House is that it sort of speaks towards um, and hints at the, at the emancipatory politics um, and the emancipatory feminist politics of the 20th century. It's very easy to map our own politics onto, onto Nora's decision to leave her family for, for, for a life um, of self-determination of, of her own freedom. And there is something in, in Hedda's um, demise at the end of the play that feels really final compared to that. And it makes it, I think, much harder to, to map on uh, a contemporary political sensibility onto that decision, particularly in regards to what I said earlier about, about the ending feeling quite incongruous with what has come before. Um, if this is something that you're interested in exploring, you might also want to read, if, you've not, um, if you're not familiar with it, um, uh, uh, Miss Julie by another Scandinavian playwright, um, Olga Strindberg, in which the character of Julie at the end of that play um, also meets uh, an untimely death. Now I'm going to sort of propose, having listed all these kind of tensions or difficulties that we face when analysing the text, um, how theatre studies might help us um, approach and consider these challenges. Um, so rather than sort of focusing on the text, as I mentioned earlier, and this idea that um, meaning or significance is to be found in the text, rather than sort of a literary analysis of the play, a theatre studies approach uh, conversely allows us to focus on the theatrical event itself, the conditions in which the performance takes place. So this can be where this performance uh, where the theatre is located, the type of theatre, uh, the language, uh, the, uh, the cultural context, the country, the period in which the work um, is staged. Um, and what that allows us to do is to recognise that the performance takes place in the social reality of its contemporary audience. And so meaning will change because the location, the time, the context of the staging will change as well. So the meaning of the text cannot be fixed. It's not to be found in the words that Ibsen wrote down, but actually it's to be found in the moment where the text is staged as a theatre performance. What this means is that meaning is contingent and sort of arises from decisions and conditions of the staging. And by decisions, what I mean there are sort of conscious choices by performers, directors, um, dramaturgs, designers, as to how the work should be staged. And so the meaning is generated in the performance by the people who decide to stage and perform it. What this means is that the author's intentions are unknowable. We can, we can maybe guess at what Henrik Ibsen wanted to say in the play. Um, we can, other people have analysed it, and we might quite often be quite correct but he's been dead for quite some time and so we don't know what he wanted or what he thought and so meaning can only be found in the moment of the performance itself this is what theatre studies um, invites us to think about and here is a quote uh, it's quite famous uh, quote by the performance scholar Peggy Phelan uh, and she wrote about performances being becomes itself through disappearance and what she says here is that performance is in innate performance nus uh, is dependent on the fact that it is that it is not fixed that it is not permanent that it disappears very much in the moment of it becoming so for theatre to be theatre for performance to be performance um, it has to it has to disappear it's not fixed. And so whenever we stage something, um, meaning is generated anew every time a play is performed. Um, and I think this is a, you know, there is the sort of the cliche about theatre that every performance is different, which of course is true. But I think this idea of theatre having to disappear means that in order to generate meaning, um, theatre has to be re-performed every time and that meaning is generated anew every time um, that is done. What that, that means is that while the, while the decisions, the internal factors might, might um, remain the same, the world outside the performance will continuously uh, be shifting and be in a state of flux. So even 
imperceptibly from day to day, the world around the performance change is, uh, and so the play itself, it's significant, its resonances will also evolve and change as the world around it does as well. Um, and to, to sort of demonstrate this, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a particular uh, production of Hedda Gabler that was staged in Cardiff in 2019. It was directed by Chelsea Walker, designed by Rosanna Vise, uh, with lighting design by Joseph Fletcher. Um, and it starred, and you can see in the photo here, uh, Helen Gwynn in the role of Hedda and Alexandra Riley as Thea. Um, and all the photographs here are by the photographer Mark Duet. Um, and you can see in this image here, um, I think, that it was an incredibly stylish production and very much uh, belonged in the tradition of sort of a mainstream director's theatre. Um, it felt, uh, well, the, the Hedda Gabler's home felt, um, felt very affluent and felt very expensive and luxurious. Um, and what is really interesting, and you can see in this image, is the sort of tension uh, between the contrasting aesthetics within the mise-en-scene because this sleek expensive furniture um, makes it feel quite contemporary but the costumes um, of the characters on stage um, is not quite so so clear uh, in which period these people uh, live and so there is a there's a tension between the contemporary uh, scenery and the slightly more uh, ambiguous costumes the people on the stage feel very much as if they are sort of out of time, as if they belong to a, a different period, if not necessarily uh, the one in which Ibsen was originally, in which originally set the play. But I think what, one of the really striking um, scenographic choices about this production um, was Hal Gwynn's hair. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a very it's blonde and tightly cropped and it feels very contemporary. It certainly doesn't feel as if it's the hair um, expected of a beautiful wife um, in the 19th century. And so again, there is this sort of temporal tension in, in the staging between the contemporary hairstyles and the, the slightly period costumes. Um, but what is really what was really interesting about the staging was that I think, or certainly in my experience of watching it, that hair played a really um, important part. Um, and to me, it was the hair in the production that kind of unlocked uh, the text and made it feel really contemporary and resonant. Uh, and so you see here uh, Alexander Riley on the left as Thea um, and Helen Gwynn on top of the piano as Hedda. Um, and there was something really interesting in the staging of a of casting a white actress as as Hedda, but a mixed race actress as Thea. I haven't got an image of the moment in question, uh, but in the fourth act, when Thea arrives um, with the news of Eilid's death, um, she was comforted by Hedda. And there was a moment where Hedda sort of reached um, to comfort her by putting her hand on her hair, but it wasn't a gentle, um, reassuring stroke. She actually went in and just sort of quite violently um, so sort of imposed herself and scrunched Thea's Afro-textured hair. And in that moment, in that gesture, in, the, in that touch, the play suddenly stopped being to me about um, the, a woman living in Norway in the 1800s, but actually became about, um, it became about race. So Hedda's privilege, her wealth, her material comforts, her social and economic um, uh, privileges um, also became in that moment uh, racialized. It became about Hedda's whiteness as much as anything else. Um, and in that also we can think of the play as being a play that is staged, um, not set in Cardiff, but staged at the theatre in Cardiff. Because Cardiff is a city that over the past so 20 or 30 years um, has been redeveloped extensively um, and there have been parts of Cardiff that have been uh, gentrified and particularly at the expense of communities that were traditionally black and African Caribbean. And so it became not just about the racism of one woman, of one woman's white privilege, but also became about um, white privilege within the city in which the theatre was located. And so earlier when I was talking about sort of the significance of performances changing from day to day, you know, even though the fact that this production was staged um, just less than three years ago, 
If we think about what happened in 2020 with the mainstreaming of the Black Lives Matter movement and protests held worldwide following the death of George Floyd, um, the fact about white privilege and about racial injustice um, in 2019, that might have been an almost imperceptible, subtle strand uh, in the play. But if you were to restage it now, I think those tensions would be far more prominent and would be uh, and would be would be read differently to how they were um, just you know, just short, a few short years ago. Um, so these are the kind of things that I would like you to think about and consider um, as you prepare for the the online uh, session. Uh, I would like you to imagine that you yourself are going to stage a production of Ibsen's texts. But rather than thinking about the, the meaning being in the text itself, that you are trying to somehow illuminate Ibsen's ideas and concerns, I want you to think about what your concerns would be, what your ideas are, what you would like to bring to the stage and how you would stage them. So which ideas your production will explore? Um, and these might be found in the text, but they might be found, there might be something external, something that you would like to bring to it that you will then explore through the text itself. You should think about how these will be foregrounded in the staging and also significantly how an audience might be made aware that these are the ideas that are being explored uh, through the production. You might want to think about where these ideas can be most appropriately and effectively articulated. Uh, is there possibly a specific moment in the text, in the script, that would be useful uh, for you to illuminate your idea? Um, and this can be like an exchange of dialogue or a specific stage direction. Um, and you also should think about the design of the production um, and how design choices, scenographic, lighting, costume, uh, sound design, um, how these might help articulate um, your vision. So if you just spend some time thinking about these and then we'll have an opportunity to, to share them uh, in the online session. Um, and I look forward to, to hearing your responses. Okay, thank you.